All right. So um, welcome, welcome everyone to the uh, to Bethel's latest uh, Jedi talk. Now I know some of you uh, might not know what Jedi stands for, and um, uh, the synagogue um, <clears throat> uh, uh, encourages people uh, from from a synagogue and also outside the synagogue to come and speak to our to, to the members of our synagogue who want to come to the Zoom meeting. To, uh, to talk about a subject that's dear to them or so, some, some specialty that they may have. Uh, for instance, Stan Solinsky, uh, uh, he uh, spoke about uh, downtown New London uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, we have other people uh, who've spoken about various different topics. So uh, it's called the Jedi Talk. It's a takeoff on uh, the Jedi warrior from, from Star Wars, except our Jedi is spelled J-E-T-I, and it stands for Jewish Education theology and information. So that's what that stands for. We, every, every Wednesday night, we have a Jedi talk here uh, on our uh, synagogue Zoom. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We get to see people and be with people. And that's, I think, the main reason why we're doing it, although it's, it's a lot of fun too. <clears throat> so this talk that I'm going to be giving is more of an informational talk. And, it's a, and my talk will be about uh, tonight's sky, the stars, and the planet we'll see in tonight's sky, the constellations. I'll talk to you about some of them. And uh, that's what this talk will be all about. Uh, and it's the sky as we'll see tonight at seven o'clock. Right now it's 6.32, but uh, we'll see the sky on the screen as it would appear at about seven o'clock tonight. And if you don't get out tonight to see the sky, you'll see the same sky tomorrow night. It'll be clear tomorrow night again. So you'll certainly have a chance to go out tomorrow night to take a look as well. And um, I'm going to be using uh, a program. Uh, it's called Stellarium. Well, actually, it's an app. It's called Stellarium. And uh, it's, a free pro it's a free app. You can download it to your computer. If you have any interest in astronomy or the night sky, uh, again, you could use this app to see the sky as it would appear a thousand years from now or a thousand years in the past. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, astronomy app. So if you have any interest, I'll be happy to give you information about it uh, if, you, if you'd like to learn how to download it. It's free and it's a wonderful program. And during, during uh, uh, as I talk to you, we're going to be using a technique called star hopping. And what that is, is um, I'm gonna point out a constellation to you. I'm gonna point that out. And then we're gonna use that constellation, the stars in that constellation to draw a line through those stars extend that line out in the sky to other stars. That's called star hopping. So we're gonna use that technique uh, during this presentation and hopefully you'll learn how to do it yourself. And next time you go outside and take a look, you'll be able to do some star hopping uh, uh, yourself and find things in the, uh, in the night sky. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna share that uh, Stellarium program with you. We'll take a look at it and <clears throat> here we go. And uh, you, might, you might notice uh, on, on your screen, uh, you, you, uh, maybe, maybe in the right part of your screen, you can see some, some uh, tiles with pictures in it. Uh, if you'd like to get rid of all those tiles, uh, some, of you, some of you see those, those, those tiles, or may, maybe not, but, but if you'd like to get rid of them, uh, at, the, at the uppermost tile, I think that's probably me in that uppermost tile, there's a little, what looks like an underscore, just, just above my tile, if you click on that underscore, all those images will go away and you'll just have talking Bruce Levine there on that, in a box. And you can move that away too. You can move that toward the lower right corner of the screen if you'd like to, to get that out of the way as well. So this is, uh, this is Stellarium, the program that I talked to you about. And, and we're, looking, we're looking at tonight's sky at seven o'clock tonight. And we're looking toward the south. You can see the compass directions in the lower part of the lower third of the screen. And we're looking due south, that S of course stands for the south and to our left is the east and to our right is the west. Uh, and we're looking due south right now. And, um, and this line you see the, just, just below the, the, the compass letters, uh, that's the horizon that looks bent, doesn't it? I could straighten it out. That's what the horizon would normally look like. But because I want you to see more of the sky, I kind of dragged it down a little bit so we could see more uh, uh, of the sky. And I'm going to drag it down so that 
we can see in the upper part of the screen right now, <clears throat> there's a letter Z there. You see that Z? And there's a plus sign next to it. That Z, that Z stands for zenith. Zenith is the top of the sky. If you were standing outside, your head would point right to that spot in the sky. That's the zenith, the uppermost point of the sky. That's 90 degrees above your head from the horizon, 90 degrees right above your head. At the horizon, of course, is zero degrees. So tonight, if you were outside at seven o'clock or tomorrow night, same, pretty much the same thing tomorrow night, look about 45 degrees up in the sky, you're gonna find this group of stars that I'm now circling with my, with my pointer. Now, um, if you'd like to, if anybody knows the name of that group of stars, you could unmute and just let me know that the name of that group of stars. Anybody know? Orion. Good. That is Orion the Hunter. And, 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 oh. after you, and after you talk, mute yourself again. Uh, that, that'd be a good idea. But that is Orion. Yes, you're absolutely right. You got the Pleiades in there too. Yes, they're there too as well. Yes. But this, these three stars in a row are Orion's belt. That's his belt right over there. Three stars in a row represent his belt. But they're surrounded by these four bright stars that make this large rectangle around those three. So this is Orion the Hunter. Orion is a very bright constellation. He's, he's, a, he's a winter constellation. We see him uh, almost all night long during the early winter season. Uh, right now, at seven o'clock in the evening, he's due south so that we don't see him. He, he, go, he sets below the horizon by, oh, I'd say about uh, uh, midnight or so, we'll lose sight of him. But during the early winter, we'll see him all night long. That's Orion the Hunter. Now I'm gonna click on one of those stars, this upper left-hand star. I'm gonna click on it and we're gonna see its name. It's called Betelgeuse. Let's take a look. That star is called Betelgeuse. It's a, it's a, it's a very bright star. And you can see here the distance away to that star is 498 light years away. Now, when we hear the word light year, I think our, uh, the tendency is to think of, of time. How old you are, a year is, is how old you are. So it's, it's a measurement of time. But in the case of a light year, it's a measurement of distance. It's how far light will travel in one year. And light is the fastest thing in the universe. It travels a little more than 186,000 miles per second. So in one year, light will travel a distance of nearly six trillion, that's with a T, six trillion miles. So if you multiply 498 by six trillion, that'll tell you how many miles away that star is from us. It's really very, very far away. And now that I've clicked on that star, I have the ability, I'm gonna take away that little circle, okay? I have the ability to go down here and click on this little icon over here. You see it says constellation lines. I'm gonna click on it. And there we can see connecting those stars, we have the figure of Orion the Hunter. Again, there's his belt and his shoulders, some very faint stars representing his head. His uh, left arm comes out to a, what looks like a, a bow, like a bow and arrow. I've even seen some images of him <clears throat> where that's an animal skin that he has in front of him. And these two represent his legs or his knees. Orion's right arm comes up this way and he's carrying a big club right here in his right arm. And I also have the ability to show you uh, some artwork. Let's take a look at that, this little icon down here, little constellation art, let's take a look at him. So there is Orion the Hunter, uh, as the ancients might have imagined him <clears throat> so many years ago when they looked up uh, uh, up at the night sky. Let me take those uh, those things away for a moment. <clears throat> and remember I said we're gonna do some star hopping. Well, we're gonna use Orion's belt to star hop. We're gonna dr draw a line through his belt from the uppermost star to the lowest. In other words, from right to left, extend that line out and that line is gonna point you to the brightest star you'll ever see in the night sky. That star's name is Sirius. It's the brightest star you'll ever see. It's, <clears throat> it's even brighter than Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse, by the way, is a super giant star. If we were to replace our sun in the solar system with Betelgeuse, 
the outer edge of Betelgeuse would come out nearly to the planet Jupiter. That's how big Betelgeuse is. It's much bigger than Sirius, but Sirius is really bright. That's because it's relatively close to us. Look at the distance, 8.6 light years away from us. Relatively close compared to Betelgeuse, which is 400 and something light years away. So because it's so close to us, and a relatively bright star anyway, it appears much brighter. It's the brightest star in the night sky. And you could, you could have a good example of this. If you, if you were to take a flashlight, hold it in your hand and shine it on, in your face, it's going to be really bright. But if you took that flashlight, had someone walk the end of a football field and shine that flashlight toward you, it's going to be quite faint. Well, same thing with stars in the sky. The further away they are, the fainter they're going to appear. Uh, despite the fact that Betelgeuse is actually much, much brighter intrinsically, much, much brighter than Sirius. But because Sirius is so much closer to us, it appears to be very the brightest star in the night sky. And Sirius is part of a, of a constellation called the Big Dog or Canis Major. And I'm going to put those lines back up. You can see there is the big dog. We have Sirius representing the dog's collar and some faint stars, his head and his front legs coming out here, his hind legs, his tail out over here. And I have a, some artwork for to show you with that dog. Let's take a look at him. So there is Sirius, the, the big dog or Canis or Canis Major. And we used Orion's belt to help us find him. We drew that line through his belt from right to left, extended it right to that bright star, Sirius. Well, I'm gonna just pull the sky down a little bit more because I wanna bring something toward the top over there. I'll just pull out a little bit more. We're gonna do some more star hopping. And this time we're gonna use these two stars on Orion's left side. To our right, uh, but it's Orion's left side. We're gonna draw a line through those two stars, extend that line in the sky, it's going to point us to a bright yellowish star called Capella. And you found it by using those two stars in Orion's uh, right, uh, le uh, uh, left side. Okay, you found Capella. And Capella, I'll take that circle away again, come down here to our constellation lines and click on it. Capella is part of a constellation called Auriga or Auriga. Uh, the charioteer. Doesn't look like much like a charioteer in this depiction. And even the artwork doesn't show much of a charioteer, but, but, the, that's, but the ancients called him uh, Origa the charioteer. He's carrying a couple of, a couple of goats in his hand as well. There's some faint stars that we call those three stars, the kids. And they supposed to represent those three goats that he's carrying in his, in, in, in his arms there. So this is Origa the charioteer. And you found him by using Orion. Let me take those things away again. And let's do some more star hopping. But this time, I want to point out a beautiful arc of stars that appears between Capella at the top of the arc and Sirius at the bottom of the arc. So we'll start with Capella. And we're going to come across around this way. And we have these two stars here, part of the arc, then this bright one, ending with Sirius. Now, this beautiful arc of stars, starting with Capella, is called the Arc of Capella. It's a beautiful arc of stars. You'll easily see it in the night sky. It goes nearly all the way around Orion. And you'll find Capella. And, uh, and once you find find Capella, then move across the sky to this star called Castor. And then the next star called Pollux. Castor and Pollux are part of a constellation called Gemini, the twins. Let me put some lines up there to show you Gemini, the twins. There are the twins up there and Castor and Pollux represent uh, each uh, twin's head. And their shoulders, their, their arms go across their shoulders. They're kind of buddies there in the sky. 
their legs down over here. And we'll put some artwork up there just to take a look at them, the twins rather. So there are the Gemini twins, all right? And continuing again, let's continue that arc and we'll keep it. So we'll start at Capella, then Castor and Pollux. Next bright star is Procyon. Procyon is part of a constellation called the Little Dog or Canis Minor. Just two stars there, this Procyon, and this little faint star, just those two. And the ancients saw a little dog there. Let's take a look at what the lines look like. You'll see what I mean. That's the little dog. Let's take a look at some artwork. We'll see him a little bit better. Well, there's the little dog. So the ancients had some pretty vivid imaginations to see these things in the night sky. So there's the Ark of Capella and Orion the Hunter and those constellations that are all part of the Ark of Capella. Now you might be out some night, maybe tomorrow night or maybe tonight, and you might spot that Ark. Of, I'm sure you'll spot it. If you look for it, you'll spot it. But you might just forget its name. You might not remember what I, what I talked about. Well, there might be a good way to remember that Ark. And you might, when, when you see the Ark in the sky, you you might just start to sing to yourself because it's so beautiful. Well, when you're singing unaccompanied by music, you're singing, ah, Capella, ah, Capella. That's what that Ark of Stars is called, the Ark of Capella. So that might be a good way to remember the name of that beautiful Ark of Capella. Okay, let's use Orion's belt in the opposite direction. We're gonna find another bright star. Draw a line from left to right, extend that line out in the sky, and it's gonna point us to another bright red star. That star is called Aldebaran. And Aldebaran is part of the face of Taurus the bull. Take that circle away. Let's take a look at the lines first. So there's Taurus the bull. So Aldebaran is one eye, here's his other eye, his nose down over here. One of his front legs comes down here. And one of uh, Taurus's horns comes up this way. His other horn comes up this way. So there's Taurus the bull. And we'll take a look at some artwork. We'll get a better idea of what he looks like. There he is, Taurus the bull. And you might notice that inside the bull, if we follow that arc, I mean the uh, Orion's belt again, follow the belt through or, or past Aldebaran. And we're gonna to come to this group of stars over here. Robert mentioned it before. That's called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. There's six or seven stars there that you can see just with your eyes alone. But if you look at those stars with, a, with binoculars or a telescope, you'll see many more stars than those six or seven. By the way, binoculars make a perfect first telescope. If you don't have a telescope, but you have binoculars, and you wanna do some stargazing, bring those binoculars outside with you. You'll see so many more stars with them than you will with your eyes alone. So the Pleiades or the seven sisters. Again, a star cluster, that means that they're gravitationally bound to one another. They're all attached to one another gravitationally. So that's a star cluster, as is Taurus's face. These stars making up this V, that's another star cluster called the Hyades. And these stars are also gravitationally bound to one another. They're all moving across the sky in the same, uh, the same rate. They're all attached to one another. And they're called the Hyades. These are called the Pleiades. So there you have those two, those two star clusters. You might have noticed that just underneath the Pleiades, there's another fairly bright reddish object there. I'm gonna click on it. That's the planet Mars. That's the planet Mars. <clears throat> it's really bright. It's still really bright. I should say <clears throat> this last October, this, just this past October, Mars was at its brightest in, 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 in you know, many years. Um, it was really bright. Now it's getting, and, and that's because the earth 
in its orbit around the sun was closest to Mars this past October. And as a result, if it being close, remember I said things closest to us are brighter than things further away. So back in October, when Mars was close to us, it was extraordinarily bright. It was the brightest thing in this. It was brighter than Jupiter even. I, I think, as, if, I, if I remember correctly, it was as bright as Venus. And Venus is the brightest object in the evening sky other than the moon. So it was really bright in October. Now it's not nearly as bright, but it's still very easy to spot because it is still fairly bright. And you might have heard in the news just, just uh, this past uh, uh, February 18th, the uh, uh, Perseverance rover uh, landed on Mars and it's uh, starting to, uh, it's, not, it's not doing anything yet. The, uh, scientists right now, are, uh, uh, the engineers are making sure all, all the equipment on the rover is working properly before they, before they start moving it around, but it's on the surface. It landed safely on the surface of Mars. And that's no small, small trick, no small feat. It's really hard to land at, uh, at something like a rover which weighs about two tons, this rover, uh, it's really hard to land it on Mars. That's, that's because the atmosphere of Mars is about 1% of the atmosphere of the Earth. So that even with, so that even with the capsule that, that was protecting the rover, as it traveled through the upper atmosphere, it was, it, it, was be, it was being slowed down because of the upper atmosphere. They had a heat shield to protect it. It was slowing down from about 12,000 miles per hour to about 900 or so. Slowed down to about 900, but much too fast to land on the ground. So from there, they deploy the parachute, a, a huge parachute. But that parachute only slowed it down to about 200 miles per hour. Still much too fast to land. From there, they, they separated the parachute from the from the uh, from the rover, and th there was a there was uh, just above the rover there was a uh, there was a mechanism that had rocket motors on it, and that rocket motor slowed it down even further, until it was about oh twenty or thirty feet above the surface, and then from there they they dropped the rover on on like a like like a crane they call it a sky crane, where where these cables dropped the rover. And it slowly touched the ground safely. And once it touched the ground, the, ro the, the rocket motors detached uh, and it flew away. And, the, and, the, and it was safely on the ground. It, it, and back in 2012, they landed the Curiosity rover on the planet Mars the same way. So the, they used basically the same technology to land this rover on the surface of Mars as well. And what I'd like to do, I'm, I'm going to stop the screen share because I'd like to show you a couple of videos. I have a couple of videos to show you. And uh, the first video is, and they're each about three minutes long. So they're not, they're not very long. Uh, the first video has the uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory engineers. And they're going to talk about uh, the mechanism, uh, uh, what they, what, what, pretty much what I just told you about what, what they needed to get this rover on the ground. They're gonna talk about that and show you some animation of that. Then the second video, we're gonna to go to the, to the um, control room. As the rover was actually on February 18th, as it was actually heading through the atmosphere, we're gonna pick up uh, at the, uh, um, uh, at the uh, 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 control room, they're gonna, we're gonna see uh, the rover uh, deploy the parachute. There, there, there were cameras on the rover. You're going to see the parachute come out. Then you're going to see the heat shield uh, uh, move away from the rover. Then you're going to see that sky crane maneuver. And you're going to actually see the rover touching the ground. So I think they're pretty fascinating. I'd like to share them with you. So let's let's go to this first video. And we'll get that up on the screen. I'll make that a little bit larger so we can see it really well. And let's go from here. And 
think that the demanding is often referred to as the seven minutes of care. If it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. The block cutting is the first leg of our campaign to try to be there. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmospheric entry, we get rid of really the space task part of the rover that's going to go to the moon. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like transforming the vehicle that went from spacecraft and now it's kind of like an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. The biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of sparks on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. The science team identified this rope crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. You look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? The heat shield, which has detected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. Having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, jettison the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky crane maneuver. Once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. Surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. Its job, right, being the first leg of sample return, to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins. We are starting to straighten up and fly right maneuver, where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Okay, in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 100. Those are actual pictures from the spacecraft. Heat shield set. Perseverance has been to subsonic speed, and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the camera to get their first look at the surface Current velocity is 3.3 meters per second, altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. President is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on 
the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the timing of the landing engine. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. We have confirmation that the land division system has produced a valid solution in part of terrain relative navigation. Driving. EPA is nominal. We have the timing of the landing engine. Shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here on safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain and altitude navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. You're going to see dust kicking up off the surface from the rockets. There's the actual pictures. Thank you, Delta. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. All right, pretty exciting stuff, pretty exciting stuff. So that spacecraft is on the surface of Mars right now. And what it's going to be doing there, it's going to be, um, it's going to be looking for, um, for evidence of, of past life on the surface of Mars, uh, looking for evidence of it. Uh, and what it's going to do, it's going to, it's going to dig some cores into the, into the, uh, in, it, uh, they landed in this crater where they think there are some clay deposits going to dig cores into those clay deposits and uh, it's going to seal those uh, 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 deposits into uh, stainless steel uh, containers. It's going to leave those containers on the surface. And then by the end of the decade, by, by, by the end of this decade, uh, Mar uh, NASA and the European Space Agency are both uh, uh, planning to send a spacecraft to Mars uh, to pick up those uh, those uh, canisters and rocket them back to Earth. Uh, and that's all gonna happen toward the end of this decade. And they're gonna be, and hopefully the uh, scientists will be able to examine, well, they will be if they get them back here, they'll be able to examine uh, 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 actual soil from Mars here on Earth to look uh, for those uh, possible evidence of, of life. And also on this rover, there's also a, um, a a helicopter. It's in the belly of the rover. It's on the on the bottom of it, and it's and uh, in about a month or so, they're going to let that they're going to deploy that helicopter onto the ground. The rover is going to move away from it, and they're going to it's 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 kind of a demonstration, just to see if this is something that's feasible to do uh, on Mars. It's got an atmosphere, a very thin atmosphere. And this helicopter weighs about four pounds or so, very, very light, but it's got big wings. I mean, big rotors. They're about a, a, a yard uh, long, uh, and there are two of them. Uh, and they're each going to spin in opposite directions from, uh, from one another so that it, it, it won't need a tail rotor. Uh, in that, in, uh, it, it could it fly stably without a, without a tail rotor. Uh, and it's a demonstration to see if this will work. And hopefully in future missions, uh, we, we, they'll have uh, they'll, they'll fly other uh, helicopters there, and they can explore much more of the surface than than a rover can. So that's uh, but that's happening right now on Mars. So I'm going to share my screen again. That Stellarium program. Let's go back to Stellarium. So there's Mars right there, and and you'll be able to see it tonight or tomorrow night. Take a look. What I want to do right now is I'd like to do an about face. Let's, we're outside looking at that southern sky. And let me take this, these away for a moment. Uh, yep, take these away. Okay, looking toward the south right now. Let's do an about face and 
look toward the north. So to do that, I've got to move the screen around. So it's as if we were just turning around. Instead of facing south, let's face toward the north. There we go. Now we're facing towards the north. Okay, that big N right, 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 right in front of us. So we're facing to the north right now. And when we do, you notice sort of towards the northeast, there's a group of star, a group of seven stars. There's this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Anybody know the name of that group of stars? You could unmute for a moment and tell me the name of that group of stars. What do you think? Is that the Little Dipper? Not the Little Dipper. The Big Dipper? The big one. That, that's, that's right. That's the Northern Star. Um... That, is, that is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper. Yes. Uh, and, you know, kind of looking at this screen, it does look kind of little. Well, we're looking at the computer screen. And, and, you know, but when you look at the Big Dipper outside, it's enormous. As is Orion the Hunter. It, it takes up a lot of real estate up there in the sky. And it does look kind of small. So it's kind of easy to say it's the Little Dipper. But that's the Big Dipper. That's the Big Dipper. Now, the Big Dipper is not a recognized constellation. There are 88 recognized constellations in the night sky. The Big Dipper is part of one of those 88. Now, every star pattern in the sky, all the ones we've already looked at, they're all called asterisms. It's, it's, a, a star pattern is called an asterism. The Big Dipper is an asterism, but it's not a recognized, a recognized constellation. You might be wondering, how did those 88 constellations get to be recognized as such? Well, there's, there's a reason for it. Well, back in the late 1800s, there were several different groups of astronomers all around the world. And they, they couldn't always agree when it came to naming new things that they discovered in the night sky. So they all decided to join forces. And in 1919, they created an organization called the, in, called the International Astronomical Union. And they formed in 1919, and they met every three years thereafter. They're still meeting today. And it was during, uh, I believe it was either the first or the second meeting in 1922, when they put together the list of the 88 constellations. They put that list together. Um, so all these other star patterns, like the Big Dipper, that's not one of the 88. But the Big Dipper is part of one of those 88. Does anyone know which one? What's the Big Dipper part of? Anyone know? Well, it's part of the Big Bear or Ursa Major. Ursa means bear and major means big or great. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to click on one of these stars, and that enables me to show you this, the, uh, the connected dots, so to speak. I'm going to take that dot away, and I'm going to go back down here to, that, to the constellation lines, and we'll take a look at the Big Bear. But there he is. So you can see the Big Dipper is part of the Big Bear. But the Big Bear is the constellation. It's, a, it's an asterism. And within that recognized constellation, we find the Big, the Big Dipper. So there's the Big Dipper inside the Big Bear. Let's take a look at the, what that Big Bear looks like for a moment. We'll take a look at him. There he is, as the ancients might have imagined him so many years ago. Now he's got a long tail, as you can see. And I think you know bears don't have tails that long. They have, they have short, stubby tails. But the ancients with their vivid imaginations, well, there's actually a story behind why that, why that bear has that long tail. I, 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 don't, I don't have a, uh, the time to really tell you. But, but, as, but as with most of these constellations in the sky, uh, there's, there's a, there's, there are uh, mythological stories behind them. And there's one story about how that bear got that long tail. Uh, so there it is. So there's that big bear. And inside the big bear, we find that Big Dipper. And we're going to use the Big Dipper to do some star hopping to one of the most important stars you'll ever see or find in the night sky. We're going to use these two stars in the end of the cup of the Dipper, the stars furthest from the handle. 
These two are called the pointers because when you draw a line between them and just extend that line out in the sky, that line is going to point you to Polaris or the North Star. And Polar the name Polaris is a name that means pole star. That's because Polaris is located almost exactly above the North Pole of the Earth. Almost exactly. So that means that as the Earth rotates or spins on its axis, Polaris is the only star in the sky that doesn't appear to move at all. As everything else is moving around the sky, Polaris appears to stay in that same spot. So as you can imagine, a very important star for a sailor because when they spot that star in the sky or they know they're looking exactly to the north, it's always gonna be there. It doesn't move around the night sky, it's always there. And uh, the, the, that, that North Star is part of a group of stars called the Little Dipper. And let's put a, uh, connect those dots and, and uh, see what the Little Dipper looks like. Well, there's the Little Dipper. And as with the Big Dipper, being part of the Big Bear, well, the Little Dipper is part of the Little Bear. And I've got a, a picture of him to show you. So there's that Little Bear, what he might look like. Now, what, I, what, I, what I'd like to do right now is I'd like, to, I'd like to put these stars into motion because I'd like you to see how Polaris stays in that same spot. I'd like to show you that. So I have a little date time window I'm going to put up here. And you can see the date is March 3rd of 2021. And 19 means seven o'clock in the evening. 1900 means seven o'clock. And uh, so what I'm going to do this little up arrow over here that my pointer's pointing to right now. I'm going to click on that. And that's going to advance the sky one hour at a time. And we're going to go through 24 hours. And I want you to see how that star stays there. I'll do, I'll do it one hour at a time. I'm going to stop right now. Now we're in the daytime. Star is still there, but it's the daytime, right? But you can see how everything goes around that North Star back to 19, 7 o'clock. But notice it's tomorrow night now. Now it's the fourth. Let's go back to the, let's go back to today. Let's go back to the third. There we go. Changed a little bit, didn't it? Just a little bit. So there you can see how Polaris, it stays in that same spot. It doesn't move. And that's why that star is so important for a mariner. It just doesn't move. It stays right there. But another interesting thing about that star is, I'm going to take this time window away. Another interesting thing about that star is the angle of the North Star to the horizon. That angle is a good indicator of your latitude. And here in New London, we're about 41 degrees north latitude. And if I had the ability to measure this angle, I, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't, you, you would see that this angle is just about 41 degrees. And as you travel further north and south, that angle is going to change. Remember I told you that the North Star is located almost exactly above the North Pole. If I was standing at the North Pole right now, the North Star would be right there, right where that plus mark is, right at the zenith of the sky. That's where you see the North Star, right at, at the top of the sky. Your head would point to it, right at the top of the sky. If I went to the Earth's equator, the North Star, as I travel toward the Earth's equator, that North Star is going to get lower and lower and lower in the sky until when I'm at the equator, the North Star is right on the horizon. As I travel below the equator into the Southern Hemisphere, the North Star will disappear below the horizon. You can't see the North Star in the Southern Hemisphere. We only see it in the Northern Hemisphere. So the sailors here in the Northern Hemisphere 
a very, very important star. Okay, I'm gonna stop the screen share. It's um, been talking to you about 45 minutes. So I thought I would stop and, and uh, give you the opportunity if you wanted to, to ask me some questions or, or you know, ha if, you if you have any comments or something like that, I'd be happy to, to answer your questions if you have any. Uh, and um, so please, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, you might you might want to unmute yourself if you have if you have a question. So please. Uh, hey Bruce, it's Robert. Hi the, Robert. The the sexton is a device that measures the angle between the north pole and the horizon. And and so and so mariners used a sexton to figure out their their latitude. That's correct. And they were in the northern hemisphere. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, they use a point, a, a naked point in the sky of this, where the southern cross is to measure how far close they are to the between the equator and the south pole. And they could also use a clock, which was synchronized with uh, Greenwich time and uh, the time of the sunrise on a particular calendar day. Uh, compared to what time the sun rose in uh, in Greenwich, England, will give them their uh, their longitude. Okay, very good, Robert. <laughs> That's well above my pay grade, but thank you for thank you for sharing that. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, I, I I just saw a quick comment from someone that uh, you couldn't you couldn't hear me. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Was that was that was that was that, was that was that a problem that people couldn't hear me? No, I could totally hear you, Bruce, but I okay. couldn't hear the people speaking on the little videos. But then it oh, got a little oh, louder. Oh, I'm so, okay. Okay. No, good. you were perfect. Oh, good. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad you could hear that. All right, good. I think you could finally hear that. That's good. That's good. So, so yeah. So, um, so uh, I'm going to put gallery view here so I could see if anybody raises their hand. I have my gallery view on now so I could see. If anybody raises a hand, I could, I could, uh, I could call on you. If anybody has a question or a comment, be happy to listen. I know that uh, at seven thirty we'll be going to Minion. I see from I see Ira raising your hand. I Please just want to, I just want to say that was excellent again, Bruce. Oh, we thank you, thank you very much, Ira. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. Yes, Sandy. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that Mars was in the belly of Taurus. Is that a common occurrence or does that, how often does that happen? Okay, well, Mars, Mars is a planet, right? Mm -hmm. And the word planet is a word that means wanderer. And planets wander around the sky, just as the earth orbits the sun once a year. Well, Mars orbits the sun once every two years, just about once every two years, so that as that happens, Mars is going to go through different constellations. Right now, Mars is located within Taurus the bull. But months from now, it'll be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different constellation. So through the course of the year, uh, Mars will travel through these various constellations. They're, they're actually, it, it travels on a path. It's called the ecliptic. The ecliptic is a path that all the planets, the sun and the moon, from our perspective on the earth, they all appear to travel through this path. And that path takes them through the 12 constellations of the zodiac. You might've heard of the zodiac. So all the planets go through that path and they all travel through those various constellations. So right now, it just happens to be that Mars is located in Taurus the bull, but several months from now, it'll be some, I, I don't remember where, I, we, could, we could look it up on, 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 um, um, on Stellarium to find out. Oops, I, 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 lost, I lost all of you for a second. Hang on a second. I just lost you. I can't see any of you. Hang on just a second. Uh, let me get you back. Oops. I can't see you. Hang on. Oh, there you are. I have you back now. Okay. I'm sorry. I did something to my screen. I couldn't see you for a second. Okay. That, 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 that answer your question, uh, Sandy? Yes. Thank you. And Bruce, this was a great lecture. And 
I hope you could come back and do some more for us, especially the mythology of the bear's tail and things like that. I think okay. That's excellent. Great okay. presentation. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Yes, Riva. Yes, uh, I was wondering why they're leaving the core samples there for another to the end of the decade. Why are they not studying them now? Well, this 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 particular rover, the Perseverance rover, doesn't have that capability. Oh, they can't bring it back. Not not with this rover. Right. right. There's no there's no space. There's no rocket to take it to take those samples back up. I see. So, but but uh, we're going to send a a a, a mission to pick up those samples and bring them back to the earth. And then we'll take a look at them. Fascinating talk. Thank you, Thank you. so Thank you very much. much. Anybody else have a question? Any other Bruce, questions? will you be able to uh, put a link up so that we can view your program again? Th this, this program is being uh, recorded mm -hmm. and uh, Bethel will, will uh, uh, put this uh, program on the Bethel, not the Bethel website, but our our uh, YouTube site, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll be up on YouTube. Look for uh, Bethel YouTube I, I, or YouTube Bethel or something like that, and you'll find it online. Uh, if you go into YouTube and look for Congregation Bethel of New London, all of mm -hmm. our um, prior Jedi talks, including um, three of Bruce's, are mm -hmm. in there. Okay, and this so one will be on tomorrow. Oh, okay, you great. can also go to our website and uh, it will take you there. If you go to our website, it will take you right there. Okay, great. Okay, good. Yes, yeah, yes, Dan. Uh, Bruce, when did you first, I mean, you're rather knowledgeable about this. It's amazing. When did you first get into it, into, uh -huh. into the stars? And do you like science fiction? Uh, I I... I got into astronomy as a youngster. I think I was about 11 or 12 years old when I got my first telescope. Uh, my parents, my parents bought me, the, bought me a telescope. I always had an interest in the stars and my parents bought me a telescope and, and I, I, I just loved it. And of course, some of you know, I, I, was, I was a court stenographer in the Connecticut court system for about 35 years or so. And when I retired in 2000, just before I retired in 2002, I began to volunteer at Mystic Seaport in the planetarium at Mystic Seaport. And I learned how to give these presentations uh, at the planetarium. And I learned a lot more about the sky. I went to school, I went to Connecticut College to audit the astronomy class there. And I, and I learned a lot more about astronomy. And um, so it's a joy for me to talk about it. And Clearly. That's where, I, that's where I learned it. And uh, what was your, your other question? I'm sorry. I, I, was just, I, I, I love science fiction. And so oh. I love hearing these talks. I was wondering, do you like science fiction? Yeah. I, or not I, so much? Well, I, I love to watch these, you know, um, Star Wars movies and the, the, these space movies. I love to watch them. Yeah. So I, I do enjoy that. I don't, I don't do much reading of, of scientific uh, uh, science fiction, but I do enjoy science fiction. Yes. Very much. Yes. Thank Monica. You. Bruce, I thought Subaru owners might want to know the meaning of Subaru because you taught oh. me that. Yeah. Uh, well, you mean you mean the Pleiades? Well, well, uh, the Pleiades is another word for Subaru. That's Japanese, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, 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 the word Subaru is Japanese, and it means Pleiades. So you might uh, you might be familiar with the with the uh, logo uh, uh, on front of a Subaru car. Those stars. Well, that's the Pleiades. That's the Pleiades star cluster right there. Mark, you had a question. My oh, name's a comment, there. actually, just commenting from my Uncle Bruce. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, say great job as always. I really like these new graphics, the uh, program. Uh, I really took it to another level, being able to see it like that. So I really like, you know, I mean, it's always been wonderful to hear you do these talks. I love it. Uh, usually, you know, I've seen you do it in person. I uh, never got to see the planetarium, but it was great to see here. And I really like th this program. So great job all around. And just thank you for the information. I loved it. Oh, thanks, Mark. It's great, it's great, to, great to see you. That's my, that's my nephew, Mark. <laughs> I'm going to go back into hiding and you guys okay. all enjoy. <laughs> okay. And I, I would like to ditto that, Bruce. Um, you're always fascinating to listen to. And we would love to have you back anytime. And I wanted to let everybody on this call know that you're welcome to join us anytime. You just use the same link 
Um, and these are always on a Wednesday night. We're thinking of stopping them for the summer and then uh, bringing them back in the fall. But I would love to hear your comments on that as well sometime if you want to email me. But anyone who's not a member of Bethel, as long as you have that link, you can save it for the future and join us anytime that you like. Kathleen, why and, don't you uh, tell them what, tell, maybe you could tell them what the next several are for those who are not part of Bethel. The next three are going to be Ira, I believe, on financial planning. Ira, do you want to say something? I see you, you're there. No, yeah, you have to unmute Ira. Yes. The first go. is financial planning, followed up by two different ones on investing. So that will be very useful information, I'm sure. Um, and these are recorded, so if you miss them, you can always catch them. Um, and again, you just go to the Bethel website. And you kind of hunch around on there, and you'll find a link to um, all the Jedis. And if I could just add one more thing, this is for everyone of all ages, but especially if you have adult children, the younger you are, the more time you have to plan and invest. <laughs> so I would suggest that you see those. Absolutely. Sounds like good All advice. Right, thank you. Okay, we have. Yep. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for for coming.